Uh, when it comes to leadership, I was always struck by a very simple definition, and I can't remember where I first read it, but uh, the author of a book said, the first duty of leadership is to define reality. So we can, we can see this done, uh, whether you're involved in the secular realm and uh, you're doing a strategic planning process or something like that, where you think about the end vision, what you'd like to see as a result of what you're doing, or you uh, uh, think about uh, your own mission statement, which would be, what are you yourself going to do in order to achieve that end vision? All right, welcome everybody. I am really excited today because I get to interview my good friend, Joe Clough. And Joe and I knew each other uh, from our days when I was in Kenya. He's still been working in Kenya from before I was there and uh, through today. And I wanted to have him on so that he has a great uh, number of insights on leadership and leading people, organizing people from many different backgrounds. So I wanted to have him talk about leadership, how to lead people, as well as share about his life and work in Kenya. Because as you all know, uh, the podcast is about real estate for income, lifestyle, and impact. And ministry, especially cross-cultural ministry, is a large part of my impact and how I want to help and benefit the world for Christ. So. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for joining me. Glad to have you. It's great to be here. All right. So we've talked about it for a couple months. Today's the day. All right. Um, so I know for a lot of people who aren't familiar with missions, you know, they kind of wonder, how does that happen? How do you grow up in Ohio and suddenly decide to work you know, among the Maasai in a very traditional setting in Kenya. So what's, what's your story? How did that come to be? Yeah, it's an interesting one at the outset. I mean, I was blessed to be raised in a Christian home. Um, so my parents gave me that, um, that history. And uh, then as I grew up, became a teenager, I went through the typical teenage rebellion lost my way a bit, decided that I wanted the American dream. Um, and then after graduating from university, I graduated in the midst of a recession. So I couldn't get my American dream going off very well. And I started for the first time in actually a number of years to pray. And I asked God, what do you want? And uh, long story short, I ended up uh, going to seminary because that's where you go when you're trying to figure out what you want to, God to do with you. <laughs> um, and then after that, even then I had no thought about going into missions. Um, my thought at that point in time was to uh, maybe go on and get my doctorate and work at a secular uh, university while being active in campus ministry. But towards the end of my seminary time, I had some friends who were going to uh, Ethiopia as missionaries, and they gave my name to a recruiter with the mission organization I am with, CMF. And so I thought, hey, it's a free lunch. So I met with him, met with the recruiter, and he said, we have uh, these opportunities. And he said, and I said, well, hold on. First thing is, it needs to be short term, which back in those days was anything under two years, because my plan is to go get my doctorate and be involved in campus ministry. So he said, okay, well, we've got a teaching opportunity in Indonesia. And I thought, man, that's too hot. <laughs> and he said, there's also this opportunity in Thailand. And I said, that's still too hot. And then he said, well, we've got this uh, campus ministry in Mexico City. And I thought, well, Mexico City, they're on a plateau. That's not too hot. And then he said, we also have youth ministry in Kenya with the Maasai. And I thought, huh, I think I'll try that. It never occurred to me that one degree south of the equator might be warm. <laughs> but God had a sense of humor and patience with me because we're at a high elevation, so it's not 
too hot there. That's how I ended up over there. Um, after being there, I fell in love with the work and the people. Uh, and my mother, I found out, found this out quite a bit later. Uh, my mother, when I was getting ready to go to seminary, in fact, I was going for a walk with one of her lady friends. And the lady friend then said, oh, it's so great that Joe's going to seminary. I always thought he would become a pastor. My mom said, I don't think so. I think he's going to be a missionary. And then mm -hmm. that would have been heaven's uh, four years before I ended up on the mission field. So don't mess with a praying mother. That's lesson number one. <laughs> Uh, so number two, I went there. I fell in love, as I said, with the work and the people. Um, and I'll be honest with you, that love, that real heartfelt desire to be there lasted for about six or seven years. I arrived in 1996 and roughly about 2002, I noticed that that passion to be there was no longer with me. It was no longer the excitement of being involved in that role. Rather, it was doing what God called me to do. And so that's why I'm still there 24 years later. The reason being is that God hasn't called me anywhere else. Uh, so that's, it doesn't sound exciting and sexy to say that, but it's reality. And we are starting to see some really cool things that, that God is doing with the people there. And so I thank God that he's let me stay there this long to start to witness some of the long-term fruit of what we've been involved in. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, you know, well, at least for me, I can relate to that. Even me just being there four years, I can relate to the passion and excitement of when you first arrive and everything's new and fresh and exciting, yeah. almost like a honeymoon period. And then that transitions, you know, that, that changes over time. But I know from knowing you and being friends with you that your passion for God and his work um, hasn't swayed over the years. So wherever he calls you and, and wants to use you, I know you're willing. So I really admire that, definitely. So you went in 1996. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those early years, what was life, what was your daily life like? You know, what activities were you involved in? Where did you live? The Maasai are a very iconic tribe. Um, and, you know, they're in a lot of pictures. It seems like any Sub-Saharan Africa pictures, the Maasai somehow show up or are included and they're well known. What, what was your uh, experience there? Yeah, it's the Maasai really are kind of the poster children of African traditional tribes. Um, but it's a lot has changed in the last 20 years in the culturally and, and um, the area of the world around them. And they've changed as a result. When I first arrived, actually, my goal, as I mentioned earlier, was to focus on getting in youth ministry and getting some youth ministry programs going. Um, and so actually though, I did not do that for the first year that I was there. Uh, the team came to me and said, hey, we have an issue. Uh, we, our business administrator is not able to return from his furlough in America. Can you please fill in until we find someone else? We notice you have an economics degree. So, uh, and so I said, well, okay, sure. So I did that for almost a year. Then I moved out into to the bush. We lived, uh, myself and my partner at the time, uh, we lived behind a, a small shop in a row of uh, cinder block rooms. And we had motorcycles. We didn't have a car. We had motorcycles and we would take off and go to various places, do trainings, meet with some of the young church leaders and try to get uh, some thoughts for them to get some new programs going, which they did. Thankfully, God deposited us amongst some really top-notch people. And we talked to them and taught them, trained them on how to do some youth ministry, what things to consider that 
might be different from uh, what you see on Sunday morning in a congregational church setting. And they took it and ran with it. It was great. That's awesome. And what were the, were you working with a certain cluster of churches or how many churches were you trying to assist? Yeah, the, the churches that we and you as well worked with, uh, they are now registered in the Kenyan government as Community Christian Church or a CCC. And now they number about 300 different congregations spread all over the country. At that point in time, there were probably 120, 150 of them. They, um, so there, we, we divided them into what, as you said, into groups of clusters so that they could work together because most of the churches are small, anywhere from 20 to 50 members. So we worked with, uh, at the time, two, well, actually three clusters um, that were about, well, one was uh, 20 miles one way, another one was just uh, 10 miles in one direction, and then another one was mostly uh, clustered about 30 miles in the opposite direction. We would go out, we would make plans, uh, which was a challenge in those days because that was before cell phones. So we had to use a two-way radio and make plans to go meet with some church leaders and uh, travel there. We'd do a couple day training and then uh, assess with them, come back. And uh, that's, you know, that's really been a pattern that I have held on to, but I've understood that number one, you, you have to find the people that God's involved with because they're the ones who, who are gonna take it and run with it. And they're gonna do it specifically not in a way that I would do it, which is annoying at first until you realize that it may be better that they do it in a way that's not the way that I would do it. But find those people whom God has appointed, equip them and let them run. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people who aren't real familiar with missions or how it works in the field, sometimes get a distorted view, like you're trying to convince somebody um, to do something or really make these sweeping changes that, that they don't, they're not really pushing that. And in reality, you're just offering this new opportunity, this new way of seeing the world, new relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the ones who really respond and take off with it are the ones you're helping, right? Right. So. Yeah, and we see this all through scripture. Uh, Jesus modeled this and showed us and told us how to do it. Uh, so many times, though, we, we think that we can just uh, follow the latest marketing principles and, and do what he wants done. For example, in uh, uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 5, 6, 7, right through there, and Jesus sends out the 72, he sends them out two by two, and he says, okay, go to all these villages that I'm going to go to, and when you get there, say, peace be upon this house, and if the peace returns to you, then you stay there. And what he was doing is he was training them to look for the people of peace, which is a principle that we still use 2,000 years later. It's awesome. And they're people that he has prepared, which is the first part of that. It's, those are people that God has prepared to receive the message and the messenger and share that message with, with people around them. So in those early years, you traveling between these rural churches, you're living in the bush, right? Mm -hmm. And how would you describe, for people who aren't familiar with the Maasai, how would you describe their, uh, the setting or how they live or, you know, are, are they, What's the situation that you're working in, working with those churches? Yeah. Um, if you've ever seen some of the old classic uh, nature videos talking about the dry, dusty African plain and, and the animals that are there, then you've kind of got the, the scene, the setting of the landscape that we had in Moss Island. Um, now, the houses in those days when I first arrived were still mostly made using uh, manure and over a frame of sticks, a tightly woven frame of sticks. Um, you'd go there and 
and introduce yourself and uh, because Africans as a whole are remarkably hospitable. Uh, you could stay the night at the house depending on the situation. Um, and so it was a lot like kind of camping in a, in a sense in the, the, in the terms of the lack of preacher comforts that we take for granted here in America. So you're going from uh, village to village and thankfully I was the second generation of missionaries on our team so I could follow up with the work and the relationships that my forebears already had. And that it gave me a great advantage because I could just walk right in and know which people had integrity and which people I should be following up with. And that uh, saved a lot of time because you're dealing with people with integrity and, and you're less likely to, to have to deal with issues of uh, corruption and, and theft and people trying to uh, use you in order to enhance their own power and position. Mm. And in those early years, how was the response? I mean, you already had connections to build upon, which is a huge, amazing blessing. But what was the general response to you and the information you were bringing? Were, the, were they welcoming? Were they confrontational? Yeah, the uh, Maasai are very welcoming if you respect their culture. So we had to learn some of the language and, and how to address various peoples, whether it's an old man, old woman, young man, young woman, address them respectfully. And as you're doing all of that, then they're willing to give you a hearing and, and return that respect to you. So there was a time of culture and language learning that was involved, that was required. Um, and that's something that is, is important in most any cross-cultural context is that you respect the, the culture. So we, once we came in with that and also because we had worked with uh, CMF missionaries who came before us and followed in their footsteps, they had left a positive legacy that we could continue. That was a great blessing as well. And in the early years when you were in the bush, boots on the ground. What were some of the fruits that you saw from that? Yeah, effort? yeah. Uh, we tried to come alongside them, some of the younger people who were already in the churches and say, okay, let's develop a youth uh, program of sorts that goes across these different clusters of churches. And so we would just uh, call, go to each cluster, the three main ones that we were working with, at a certain appointed time, meet with those leaders, give them training, equipping, give them examples, show, you know, the old model assist watch leave or show assist watch leave uh, mantra that we practice. And so that's what we did. And so what we found out is that some of these people, because they were such uh, great people already and had that integrity and were sharp people, they just took what we did and ran with it. So all we would do is maybe follow up for a while and and give them lesson ideas, what have you. And, and they would just implement them as they saw fit. And so it really, um, the, in terms of fruit, we very quickly within a year saw the development of a youth program uh, that was indigenous that we could pretty much kind of step out and just kind of advise as outsiders. Yeah, that's awesome. And what I know, you know, when I was in Kenya, you had transitioned to working with Maasai churches more as a whole and not specific locations and eventually working with all of the CCC churches in, in Kenya, whether that was in Turkana region, Samburu, wherever. Um, what was that transition like and really what led to that? Yeah, what happened was I went, I came back on furlough um, and it ended up being a fairly extended furlough because I was uh, involved with some things here in the United States. Went back to Kenya and the missionaries, the missions team was withdrawing from the day-to-day -day involvement in the churches, allowing the uh, 
Turkana and Maasai leaders to take over, which is what our goal always was. So I ended up shifting from working with the youth to, as you say, working with the, some of the leaders across all of the CCC churches and legitimizing them in the eyes of the government and uh, working on their structures so that they could continue without us. And that lasted roughly from the early aughts to about 2015. So 10, 11, 12 years, something in that range. And by 2015, that role was also done. The, um, the church leaders, the Turkana Maasai church leaders, they were able to run their own meetings and, and minister and pastor their own churches without our day-to-day -day involvement. Which, yeah, is great. That was the goal from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to let go and step back and see them take off with that large organization, uh, that's really, that's great. So what type, if that ended in 2015, what have you been up to now, man? <laughs> yeah, um, it was, um, it, w it was a tough time. 2015, um, we went on furlough in June and uh, it was a hard time. I, starting roughly 2013, 2014, I was uh, involved in some team conflict uh, directly. And then we had another instance of team conflict on the side. Um, so the team was going through a lot of turmoil, turmoil. And as I said, part of that was my direct involvement. Um, my role of assisting these churches to be organized and manage their own affairs was largely accomplished. So we came back on furlough, my family and I in June 2015. And my question was, do I return to Kenya or am I done? What do you want, Lord? Uh, because I was pretty burnt out at that point. Um, and <laughs> interesting story, we were getting ready to go from Ohio out west to Colorado and even on to Oregon. We had this large trip planned in early August 2015. And uh, we had a lot of support to raise and I was burnt out and frustrated. So we get in the car, load the family up. My kids at the time were three and five and we start to make the drive out. We st spent the night um, at a man's house and I knew him, but not very well. I just knew that he was passionate about missions. He was a widower. So my wife took the kids upstairs to put them in the bed that night at his place. And I was sitting in the living room with him, just kind of talking, trying to do the polite thing. And so I asked him, what do you do? And he said, well, my day job is renovating houses, but my real ministry is making disciples. And I said, huh, tell me more. And that was the beginning of roughly a six month process while we were on furlough from August of 2015 up through into January 2016, a process of God taking me and changing my focus and changing me too. Um, and so I returned to Kenya in the summer of 2016 with the purpose of developing disciple making movement strategies uh, working alongside the CCC churches as well as outsiders. And it's been an amazing journey. It's exciting and um, amazing what slight interactions between people, what, how God can use those mm -hmm. chance encounters, you know, or what feels like a chance encounter. Mm -hmm. What a great uh, impact that can have. So for people unfamiliar with the disciple making movement concept, what, what exactly is that? Or what is a disciple making movement? Yeah, uh, disciple making movements, it grew out of an earlier uh, mission theory called church planting movements or CPM. So we have disciple making movement, DMM, church planting movement, CPM. CPM uh, thought started 
really kind of in the late 1980s. And the goal was to plant small house churches very rapidly, keeping them all indigenous and do it in very simple ways that could be reproduced and see what the Holy Spirit did. So they began to have some really cool things happen in the 1990s, mostly in Asia. And then by the early to mid aughts, uh, some of the early practitioners of this shifted to places like West Africa, started to see some of the same things happen. And they made a shift in their approach as well. They said, okay, let's not focus on planting an actual church, hence church planting movement, but let's focus on making disciples and then the Holy Spirit will work to form those disciples with the guidance of scripture and our input to into a church. Because Jesus said when uh, in Peter's great confession, you know, you are the Christ, the son of a living God, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So he's the one who builds the church, not us. Hmm. We are called to go make disciples, and we believe that the distinction is important. So disciple-making movements. What it is is that we go out, we search for those people whom God has prepared, and we give them the gospel in basically by starting what are called Discovery Bible Studies. Um, we have them start the, the Discovery Bible Studies if they are willing, and then we show them how to do it very simple they get a piece of scripture they have four main questions what does this tell you about god what does this tell you about people is there a command to obey or my i will statement what will i do and then lastly who am i going to tell so those four things and that's it and with that the discovery bible study we in prayer trust that the holy spirit will take the scriptures and start to change the hearts of those people and as they obey, then they have their hearts turned and they're discipled from darkness to light by obeying the scriptures. Because it's so simple, the hope is that then they would be able to reproduce that and by the power of the spirit, it would multiply. And so what we really what we want is we want to see Pentecost breaking out all over the world. And we've seen some of that. It's great. I love the concept and uh, I love that it's focused on the individual and helping them with their felt needs. And I love that it's authentic. They're just sharing what's really impacted them, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm excited, excited about the work and what you're doing. Definitely. Let me interject one thing. Uh, you mentioned the individual, and that's very much true. It's, it's basically I, um, taking what you meant in that it's up to the person that we're talking to uh, to uh, receive and do what God is telling them to do in their lives. That much is true. But what we try to do is do it in such a way that it's done in groups. Mm. Um, so, for example, we look through scripture and we see people like the Philippian jailer, we see Lydia, all these examples of people in the New Testament who were parts of smaller groups. They immediately formed a group and that group then uh, came to Christ and Lord willing later formed a church at that location. So it, there is a strong group based mentality. However, uh, what is different from what we think of traditionally in Christian ministry is that I'm not the center. It's the, the group working with the Holy Spirit while trying to obey the scriptures. Sure. Yeah. And so what is your, what is your vision for what will come with this ministry? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was working with uh, uh, some of the guys um, in CCC and talking about uh, planning a vision with them and where should we go with it. And so I modeled for them just a simple geometric progression, comparing that with arithmetic progressions. You know, if one person's, person reaches 
one person, then you have two people, and then if those two reach two more, then you have four, and then eight, and 16, and so on and so forth. And that would be the geometric progression. So we were talking about all of this, and, and we're casting the vision, okay, what's this gonna look like in 20 years? What's your goal? And uh, they said, well, they looked at the, the progression, the numbers progression in that geometric model, and they said, 13 million. We want to see 13 million disciples in the next 20 years. And I said, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's their vision, not mine. So I'm not, you know, going to stand in the way of that. And, and it sounds totally nutty, it's totally crazy. But, um, you know, you, I don't know if you've gotten his report or not, but one of our, our teammates who's working in Turkana, Joel Williams, just a week or so ago, he sent out his report for what's happened this year during pandemic lockdowns. And uh, in terms of numbers, they've seen more than 1,200 new baptized believers, 2,500 discovery move, uh, groups meeting. And that's just in the work that he's aware of. Uh, the guys that I trained, I mean, they've got numbers of discovery groups that are meeting and they're starting to see people come to faith in Christ. Um, even here in America, uh, I've been blessed to, to be partnered with a couple of women here. I'm in Indiana, in, in Indianapolis, and a couple of women here who are doing evangelism. We're looking at now uh, working, trying to see what God can do for a disciple-making movement strategy here. And so now there are four of us, actually, who uh, just met together on Sunday and said, hey, let's, let's see what God does. So it can happen anywhere. And uh, the vision is God's because he said, Jesus himself said, this gospel will be preached through all the world and then the end will come. That's Matthew 24, 14. So, hey, if Jesus said it, it's true. He also said the harvest is plentiful, so it must be true. The people are out there waiting for us to tell them about Christ and doing it in such a way that he can work by the power of his spirit in submission to the scriptures that he inspired. Yeah, that's all, that's exciting. What a vision. How could you yeah. not want to be a part of that vision, right? <laughs> yeah, and let, me give, and let me give you another story. I mean, you know, I'm focused on this stuff, trying to figure out, okay, how can we do this here in Kenya? Um, and I was uh, taken to a, a new area. Um, it's outside of its pattern hour or so from Eldoret, a town that you know in mm -hmm. western Kenya. And I'd never been there before. Um, I never would have chosen to go there in terms of mission strategy, but God led me there. And um, I was doing some trainings up there and they're starting to get the vision. They're starting to think about what God can do. Uh, they, and their vision was, hey, let's see if he will use us to plant a thousand small churches from these discovery groups in the next five years. Let's see, you know, God's in control. And, you know, if they only get 500, well, <laughs> shucks, you know. And so we're meeting with these guys and they have this vision. One of the trainings I'm up there, one of their key leaders, he's a young man, great guy. He was sick. Uh, he was really sick. And so he was kind of out of commission the few days I was there. Went back to Nairobi, I called back up there and made plans for the follow-up training. And I said, oh, hey, is, uh, you know, is George, is he, you know, is, how's he doing? Is he doing better? And they said, oh yeah, he's better. And I said, okay, great. Well, will he be at the training, the upcoming training? And they said, uh, no, he's in Dubai. And I said, what? And sure enough, um, you know, I get their contact from him through social media, we're communicating. And he said, yeah, here, I'm in Dubai. I got a work permit. I, and here's a picture of me. And I'm hooked up with this international church in Dubai. And here we are prayer walking the streets of Dubai, looking for persons of peace, people who might be interested in coming to faith in Christ. I'm like, oh, God's in charge of this. I'm not. I never would have planned for that. Never even, you know, it wasn't even on my radar but it was on God's and he can do it. That's exciting. Be faithful with your task and he can use it for great things, right? Yep, yep. Well, that's great. I'm excited to see what comes from it. I know it will be a great, great fruits mm -hmm. and uh, a huge impact in 
you know, it's nice to talk numbers and this many people baptized and this many people reached, but when you think about the reality of the lives changed and the families that are changed and how communities are different, um, the impact is just hard to even imagine, hard to even comprehend. So, so I'm excited for your work, Joan, and I always enjoy hearing about it and getting updates. So, yeah. So I wanted uh, you to be able to share about your work and I also wanted you to share some insights on leadership. Mm -hmm. And I, I liked hearing the story about your supporter who rehabbed houses, interestingly. We've got some rehabbers watching and listening. And, but it, that's what he did for a day job, but his passion uh, was making disciples, right? Bringing others to Christ. Mm -hmm. And for me, there was a struggle mentally when I was leaving the mission field that suddenly I'm no longer doing God's work, mm -hmm. right? I was, and now I'm not. And it took a while to come to terms with that whatever profession we're in, whatever uh, activity we do during the day to uh, make money and provide for our family, we are in God's will. God can still use us, mm -hmm. right? That business um, is a great part of missions, just like pastors are and missionaries are, and that we all are part of his will and can be a part of his his work. So I love hearing that. And always want to be encouraging to uh, all the investors listening and watching that just because you're in full-time business does not mean you are not in ministry, right? Our businesses can have a huge impact beyond the numbers for the profit and loss sheet. We greatly impact just in, in my rental business, what I constantly try to reaffirm for my staff is that we are providing good houses, not just to provide a house and to get that rent paid, but because that provides a better life for that family. We are improving families' lives by providing good housing. We are improving communities because the houses are fixed up in those communities. Mm -hmm. And so the work that we do does matter. And with my business, I really want to leverage it, leverage that portfolio to be involved in missions overseas and have an impact overseas as well. So, but specifically related to leadership. Now, your role in Kenya, you were leading, working with leaders who were overseeing hundreds of churches Kenyan leaders, as well as working with leading missionaries who came from all different backgrounds in the States. And I know that that is not an easy role, just having so many people from so many backgrounds, often very individualistic driven people. Um, so what, what are some things you learned? What were some keys really to being successful in that role? Yeah, uh, when it comes to leadership, I was always struck by a very simple definition, and I can't remember where I first read it, but uh, the author of a book said, the first duty of leadership is to define reality. So we can, we can see this done, uh, whether you're involved in the secular realm and uh, you're doing a strategic planning process or something like that, where you think about the end vision what you'd like to see as a result of what you're doing, or you uh, uh, think about uh, your own mission statement, which would be, what are you yourself going to do in order to achieve that end vision? And so for us, our team, we have the end vision of unhindered discipleship. And so it, that actually comes from the very end of the book of Acts. Uh, it's a, great story, but the very last word in the book of Acts in Greek is unhindered. And that was spoken, of course, of Paul when he's physically in prison, but yet the gospel went out unhindered. We're looking at unhindered disciple making, and so we have as a team, our goal is to catalyze God's kingdom expansion in Kenya and beyond. 
and right now we're already uh, experiencing that God is taking it faster than what we had thought possible. I, you know, I just gave the story of a guy I know who's in Dubai, uh, or other colleague, he's already got Discovery Bible Studies meeting in Uganda, the next country to the West. And so you have this vision, you set it out, and, and, you, and you use that as your guidepost to make sure that you are on track. Depending on your personality, some people are naturally very strategically minded. Others, we need to have a certain set time, maybe quarterly or annually, where we, we sit down and say, okay, am I still on track with my end vision? So those are the, some things that, that we consider. Um, and a, a practice in our team is that twice a year, every January and then every July, we write uh, ministry action plans and we review what had happened in the last six months, what's going, what we would like to do in the upcoming six months, um, and, and, and in an effort to try to make sure that we're not uh, getting lost. Because Jesus modeled all of this for us. He was, he had a laser-like focus. He was incredibly focused on his vision, uh, which was uh, bringing together some people, training and equipping them as he went toward Golgotha and was crucified to redeem the entire cosmos. So that's what he did. And, you know, there's, there's a, a few fantastic tidbits in the scriptures that always remind me of just how focused he was. One was when he met with the Syrophoenician woman. And, you know, she comes to him and says, oh, please, we need this help. And, and he says, you know, it's not good for uh, us to, to, you know, give these scraps to the dogs, in effect. And the Syrophoenician woman answers back and said, well, even the dogs need to eat something. And you read that, and I'm like, man, is Jesus, like, is he a bigot or something? What's going on here? Well, no. It was known that he came to seek and save the lost sheep of Israel. That was his vision, his focus, boom, get that done. And then with his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, of course, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit that he gave, it expanded to the universe. So he's, he's focused on that. And so when someone outside of that vision comes in, the Syrophoenician woman who's not a Jew, you know, his initial response is, um, no. But she presses him, and he says, okay, fine. And he goes ahead and blesses her. Same thing happens with um, the Roman centurion. You know, it, and I forget what account it is, if it's Luke or Mark, but the centurion does not come to Jesus for healing for his, his worker. Instead, he sends some of the officials from the local synagogue. Why would he do that? Because it was known by everyone that Jesus was there for the lost sheep of Israel, not for Gentile centurions like himself. So he sends the uh, leaders of the synagogue, they come to Jesus and, you know, they basically say, hey, Jesus, we got this centurion, he's really helped with the synagogue, can you throw him a bone? And Jesus says, well, sure, I'll come. And then the centurion sends a message and says, listen, I understand authority. When I tell someone, one of my men who's under me to go, they go. When I say, come, they come. You don't come to my house. You just say the word because you have authority, Lord Jesus. And Jesus' response was, never have I seen such faith in all of Israel. However, we have to keep in mind that Jesus, because his focus was on the lost sheep of Israel, he would not likely have gone to to bless the centurions and do a miracle in the centurion's house had the jewish leaders of the local synagogue gone to him and said hey jesus can you help this guy out so that just shows the amazing focus of jesus that sometimes we can even misread it as tribalism that he was only focused on the jews uh, but no, that's not what it was about. He was about his ministry, and boom, he had a laser light focused on it, and he didn't stop. So we need to be the same way. When we think about how we're going to define our work. Now, for us in the secular realm, that might take a little bit of time, that first step of saying, okay, what's my end vision here? 
what do I want to see five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road because I'm here? That's where we start. What do we want to see? And that's something that as Christians, we, we address prayerfully. We say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? You know, you're the one in charge. I've got these skills. I'm invested in this property. What would you have me do? Step one. And then over time, he reveals that to you. And then you begin, uh, uh, alongside of the Holy Spirit, you begin to hone down that vision so that that's what your focus is. I think that that's insightful. And in that not only does it clarify really what you're working towards for personal application. I mean, um, I think it's, it is very insightful with Jesus and how he was so focused. And obviously he had a heart for all people, but on his time on earth, he was focused on that limited uh, work with yeah. the Jews. Yeah, amazing. But for our application in our life and specifically, you know, related to business and real estate, um, for one thing, I think that act, just that, that, process of clarifying your vision and really what you're working to create, not only does that clarify what you're going to do, right, what we're going to work on, what we're going to focus on, but it also pushes aside all of the other stuff. It gives us the freedom to say no. It gives us the freedom to not get distracted by all these other things. And so many times, especially yeah, especially when people are getting started in real estate, they hear about somebody succeeding in wholesaling. They're making this much money in wholesaling. They're, they're doing flipping and they're doing so well in flipping. Or this guy's buying rentals. He's doing so well in rentals. And we have a tendency to want to do it all, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it is uh, amazingly freeing to take the time to clarify what exactly is my vision for the end? Where do I want to end up? what tool is going to get me there, right? And then just push the rest aside. Sure, if somebody's making money in everything. Somebody's successful in every area. Um, but we need to clarify what our vision is, where we're going, and really what God wants for us uh, through our business. So I think that's hugely insightful. Uh, you also talked about that that vision that, that – uh, where you want to end up that you need to kind of clarify that and break it down into um, daily activities. Th those weren't your words, but that's how I interpreted it. Can you go into that a little more? Yeah. Um, now, I'll, let me actually give the example of uh, the CCC leaders that I work with and they had the vision of reaching 13 million uh, people in the next 20 years. So we have this vision, uh, it's really big. What do you do? Well, you go back to your house after this meeting and you say, well, that was an interesting meeting and you throw your notes aside and go about your business. And that's really what happened. I later realized, I thought, wait, this vision is it's too abstract. We need to break it down. So I'm working with guys who come from roughly eight different uh, regions, eight different uh, larger scale clusters in the church spread all over Kenya. So we have 13 million. Uh, let's start by dividing that by eight, just as a rough measure. And then we end up having, you know, less than 2 million per leader that was in this, this, uh, this initial meeting. Oh, that sounds easy now. Yeah. Two million. <laughs> hey, you know, we have 20 years, two million. All right, and then we, we started defining, okay, now, you, if you wanna see you know, two million roughly, uh, leaders or new disciples in your areas, what do you do? Okay, you bring one person that you're discipling. All right, so they did. Next meeting, they came with one person. A couple of them came with two guys, that was great. And so they said, okay, now we we are not only say already making the first step the first disciple but 
when it comes to a geometric progression, your work just got cut in half. You need to see what, how God can lead you to uh, making a million instead of two million, because there are now two of you. And so we, we start uh, step by step modeling, showing how to, to do that. Now, of course, in a real estate investing uh, situation, that's going to be very different. And also, when we think about missions, you'd asked about that earlier. I mean, a bulk of our time is still dealing with the same warp and woof of day-to-day -day reality that you're going to deal with uh, here in the States. I mean, you still got to file and pay your taxes. You still have to to interview people for a working position. You still have to, you know, uh, get gather the assets you need uh, to 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 do your job, whether uh, the, the things you need are a laptop, a good cell phone, and a pickup truck, or whatever it is, you know. All mm -hmm. of those things um, we, we have to, to take into account. They take a lot of our time, and they are important because those small things are going to what enable us to do the larger things. Uh, so in a secular realm, you know, one thing would be, do I need another staff person? That's going to greatly complicate your work. However, if you're bringing someone else in with a different gifts and skill sets, that complicating work might be outweighed by the blessing and impact they bring to you. Yeah. So that, those are things that we, we need to consider every single step on the way. Yeah, sure. Well, I think, you know, a couple key takeaways completely from what you're saying, um, you know, in the world of real estate, one is, it's not a sweeping, big sweeping action. You mm -hmm. know, if with, with your example in the mission field, you don't get 2 million disciples by suddenly doing some amazing, miraculous thing to bring in 2 million people. It's day in and day out inviting one more person and then having them invite one more person, right? Yeah. It is small acts over time. And yeah. similarly in business, we're not going to build a portfolio of 100 rentals by finding that one seller who desperately needs to get rid of 100 rentals. We're going to do it by doing those small activities day in and day mm -hmm. out. We're going to talk to sellers. We're going to talk to lenders. We're going to learn new skills. We're going to be making offers on houses, all of those things. And it's yep. only over time uh, that we'll, we, we will create that long-term vision. And additionally, yeah. Yeah, additionally, I think he is like with the DMM and inviting others to help bring that big, massive vision to reality. Mm -hmm. With yeah. business, we need to include more people. Yep. I mean, it yeah, is. I, I think, I think, Chad, on that particular point, um, you know, you yourself are, are illustrative of that uh, because uh, your father was involved in real estate. And so in terms of, in your own perspective, you know, some of that was already modeled for you. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, in my realm, when it comes to making disciples, uh, I look at first and foremost, my kids. Um, and uh, I, whenever I go out, for example, I go out in trainings. I mean, these are, you know, three, four, five, seven hour drives away that I'm taking to go to these various places. So I'll usually leave before dawn, before the kids get up. The night before then, I meet with the kids. I tell them, hey, this is where I'm going tomorrow. This is where, what I plan to do for the next few days. Will you pray for me? And so I get on my knees. They lay hands on me. They pray over me. Uh, my kids at this point are ages 10 and 8. We've been doing this for several years now, and they have a, a role in my ministry. Um, and so just like with your father starting off with real estate and, and modeling that for you, let's look around and see who else is out there that, that could, could partner with us in that. And, and don't forget to disciple and model your children if you have any yeah i think that's great is the the concept of 
casting a vision and inviting others to be a part of it, mm -hmm. right? If that's business, here's where our business is going to go. Here's the impact it's going to have and, and come with me. Let's build it together, whether that's a partner or an assistant or uh, employee, contractor, whatever that is. And that's the same with family. Mm -hmm. I love this time of year with my family talking about what are we going to do in the next year? What trips are we going to take? What things are we going to be a part of? What activities? What ministry? What will our year look like? Because, and, and just the idea that we're in this together. We're working mm -hmm. on it together, right? This is our vision we're going to bring about together. Yeah. So I think there is huge power in that. Yep. Yeah, and so from there, you know, you're looking at uh, a lot of the day-to-day -day work. I mean, we, you're going over your vision and your, your mission uh, like I said earlier, for us in my work, it's twice a year, uh, so it's not a day-to-day -day thing. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day stuff that you're involved in, you, you got to find the proper ways to keep yourself on the, the straight and narrow with regards to that, keep that focus. And thankfully, we live in an age where there are so many resources. I mean, you've got your mastermind that you do, you've got uh, this podcast, you have uh, so many other resources that you're that you're putting out and other people are putting out to, to for people to join in with. And so there are all these, these uh, means that we can use to keep ourselves motivated when those tough times hit. Yeah, that is, which it really is key. So when, because we all hit those tough times and we all hit periods of struggle and that doesn't mean we're a failure or we're doing something wrong. It just yep. means we're human especially human trying to do something different or do something big right <clears throat> so yeah i appreciate that appreciate the encouragement and uh, i hope everybody leaves this interview excited about dreaming big and casting a vision for their their business their life their family and understanding that that's going to be a process that you want to include other people you want to work through obstacles on the way, but in the end, it is all worth it. It is all um, that what we do in business in life is all impactful and can have a great impact mm -hmm. and really can be a great part of God's will. So I'm really grateful for your time today, Joe. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story and your insights. If people want to find out more about uh, your family and the work you guys are doing, what's a good way for them to do that? Yeah, we've got uh, our organization's website, uh, www.cmfi.org. That's CMF International, Christian Missionary Fellowship International. So www.cmfi.org, and uh, they can go on there and uh, do a search for my, my name, uh, last name, Clough, C-L-U-F-F, and it should take them to a page uh, there uh, where it gives us a short bio and things like that. Um, and then if they're interested, they can uh, be linked there to our occasional updates and what have you to talk about more. Plus, hey, you know, we are in the US uh, during COVID right now. And so if, you, if anyone wants to have a Zoom call or what have you, they can, uh, communicate through the office to me, or they can email me directly at joeclough at cmfi.org. And I'd be happy to talk to them more about what God's doing. That's awesome. That's a, uh, a blessing that comes from this crazy COVID situation, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would definitely encourage anybody, if you want to find out more about Joe and his work that he's involved in in Kenya, really how God is using him and his family and the impact that it's having, definitely check them out, uh, their story at cmfi.org. Definitely uh, reach out to Joe. It was joeclough at cmfi.org, correct? That's my email, yeah. Okay. Reach out to him and if you have any questions and uh, yeah. So I appreciate your time, Joe. Thank you very much for joining me and sharing. Always enjoyable. All right. My pleasure, Chad. Thank you. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.